Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Sangeeta. Hi. Hi. Hey. Oh, it's so nice to see you guys. Oh, it's dark. Oh. It's dark over here. It's dark. Oh, there you go. Can you see it now? It's Marianne from Florida. Hi. With my friend. Oh, wow. Denise Florida. Ryan from Florida. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, Ernie. Hi, Helen. Hi. So great hey. to see you. It's good to oh see you. Oh, my gosh. This is so fun. I can see everyone. <laughs> Hi, Helen. Hi, Ernie. Oh, there's Hi. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Hey. Hey, hi. <laughs> hi. Dan. Yes, hello. <laughs> We're up to 32 so far. I mean, we'll give everybody a couple of minutes. Sure. Um, come in. We actually had um, 70 people that registered for tonight. So that was really? Awesome. Well, that's yeah. outstanding. That's you. Yeah. It's a testament to Sangeeta's work, right? It's just yes, it was certainly is. flawless. Hi, Sangi. <laughs> Oh I just want to welcome everybody. My name is Erica Hellstrom, and I'm the acting executive director with the Monmouth Museum. And uh, we really had some fun kind of getting uh, some virtual galleries up and running. And I think we're starting to get the hang of it now. But either way, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we have William Wagner's work uh, in the main virtual gallery and now Sangeeta Budke's work in our virtual Nielsen gallery. And so I'll just hand it right over, Sangeeta, if you want to get started and kind of tell everybody a little bit about yourself, I think that would be great. Yes, thank you, Erica. Um, I am so happy and touched to see you guys all here. I see my pastel students. I see some of my art collectors. I see people from my Instagram family. And I see a lot of family and friends. And thank you so much for spending your Saturday evening with me. It means so much to me. And before I begin, I want to thank the Monmouth Museum for inviting me to display my art here. Uh, many of you may not know this, but in 2009, I had my very first solo exhibition at the Monmouth Museum. I actually have the postcard from that show. Can you guys see it? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so that was back in 2009. And here we are in 2021, and I'm having my first virtual solo exhibition. So Monmouth Museum will always have a special place in my heart. Um, you know, I wanna keep this interactive. Um, if you guys have any questions, comments, thoughts that aren't addressed tonight, just please feel free to reach out to me. You can email me, you can DM me on Instagram. I love hearing from you guys. It makes me really happy. So please feel free to reach out to me even after this. Um, all right, I'm so excited to share the paintings in the show with you and tell you about myself and my artistic process and a little bit about my technique and tell you about more specific pieces in the show. So I am a self-taught artist. Everything I have learned about art has been through experiences in my life. I have always been a really visual person. When I was a kid, I started creating these journals of sketches and drawings to document events in my life. And I personally find it easier and more encompassing to use pictures to describe something. And I have this memory that I wanted to share with you guys of something that happened in high school. Um, I was in my English class and we were discussing the Great Gatsby. And my teacher, I asked us to write about a character in the book and how it related to the idea of the American dream. And so he starts walking around the room and he stops at my desk. And I'm really lucky that he understood me and that I didn't get into any trouble. But he picked up my paper and he said, wow, can I pass this around the classroom? And I had basically sketched a portrait of Daisy Buchanan and written kind of like a few words about her character. And that's just the way I've always taken notes and been able to express myself is with pictures. And I, I can remember much more with pictures than words. And I think that because I'm such a visual person, it sort of lent itself really well for me to, you know, start creating art and drawing and expressing myself through pictures. And okay, so I'm gonna fill you in on a little habit that I have that I desperately try to control, but it gets away from me a lot. I get really, really excited about 
you know, details, intricate details and small nuances of people and still life. And when I'm having conversations with people, I often have to control my eyes from wandering because I start to notice sometimes like the way the light is hitting someone's hair or the reflections in someone's eyes and how amazing it would be to capture that and what pastels I would use to create the composition. So if you are having a conversation with me and you notice that I am no longer looking in your eyes, I truly apologize, but also know that something amazing about you has caught my attention in my head and I just created a work of art about you in my mind. So, you know, I'm, I'm working on it, but I can't, it's just the way that I think and the way that I notice the world. Um, so a little bit about how I even started this. When I was 16, I started selling drawings of commissioned portraits. And I continued selling um, portraits until I graduated. And I immersed myself in art in the best possible way. I was creating art, I was selling art, I was reading about, about art. So you know, the most obvious next step for me after graduation was then to attend the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign to pursue a degree in finance. And um, in all honesty, the only reason I chose finance is because I didn't know that you really could pursue a career in art. And I didn't know that was an option. And I really liked math. So that's, where, that's how I ended up in finance. And the next four years in college, the only art I created was pictures I drew while I was note taking and of course my art journals. And um, it was rough, it was rough. I, I feel a certain way when I'm creating art. And um, I just, I didn't feel like myself and I knew what it was that was missing. So after graduation, I, I worked in finance for a very brief time and made the decision to pursue my dream of sharing my art with others. And, you know, I'm really happy that I chose that path versus finance because I don't think there's any way I would have been able to um, create anything that I've been creating in the last few years pursuing that career. And, um, you know, in, 2000, in 2007, I began this totally crazy and amazing journey. Um, art has allowed me to travel the country teaching workshops and classes and meeting people that I would have never been able to meet. Um, I've exhibited my paintings across the world through exhibitions, private collections and publications. And every time a collector or anyone that has seen my art reaches out to me to let me know how they felt when they saw my painting, I feel so touched and so grateful um, for that experience. And I, I really do truly feel blessed that I got to enter. Basically, it's this zone of conception and imagination and technicality where time doesn't exist. And I can only visit this place when I'm creating art. There is really no other, no other way I can get there. And there's a certain level of energy and concentration that I use when I am painting. And if I cannot dedicate 100% of myself into that energy, I just cannot create. And the reason I'm sharing that and sharing this part of my life with you is because I, I think it helps explain what happened between 2015 and 2020. So, you know, life has a way of throwing us unexpected twists and turns. And in 2014, my husband and I got our own unexpected twist and turn. We found out that we would be expecting our first child. So in 2015, I welcomed my daughter to the world. And I just remember, I remember that moment when I got to see her for the first time. And I took one look at her and I felt that energy that I feel when I'm creating my art, sort of just jump into this little girl. And I knew that my focus was her. 
and that I would not be able to enter that zone of creation at the magnitude that I was creating before. And I mean, I can tell you, there is nothing in the world that I know of at least that would keep me from painting except her and my son who was born in 2018. They, you know, they basically gave me a new definition of love that I really didn't know existed. And that, and it really translates into the pieces that I created after their births. And I can see the difference in my art before they were born and afterwards. So I feel like it's such a big part of who I am and my journey as an artist. And so I just wanted to share that with you guys. And that basically brings us to 2020. And, um, you know, like all of you, I was watching what was happening in 2020 and trying to process and trying to understand. And it was those moments of reflection that led me back to the studio. And so I am back painting again and creating again. And I say that with the biggest smile on my face because it brings me so much joy. And this show that I'm about to show you, Center Stage, is above all about life. So when you view my paintings, whether it is a portrait, a flower, or a fruit, I hope you feel the life in each piece. I, you know, I would love for you to travel into this world I have created and become part of it. So it brings me so much joy to enter this show with you and begin talking a little bit more about some of the pieces in the show. And I do have some questions that um, people gave ahead of time as well. So as you want, I can throw you a question and okay. sorry that sounds other good. people too will jump in and, and ask as they go along, so. Okay, sure, sounds good. All right, so the first piece I wanted to talk about in this show, I'm gonna zoom right in. There we go, all right. Okay, so I wanted to start with I Will 2020 because this is the first piece I created in 2020 after I knew I would be returning to my art career. Before I begin a painting, I like to write down like a word or a phrase to help guide the story that I want to tell. And for this painting, I'm actually going to share with you what I wrote down. Let me just grab it. Okay. So I had written, I will see fear in 2020. I will see evil in 2020. I will see grief in 2020. I will see compassion in 2020. I will see generosity in 2020. I will see resilience in 2020. I will see love in 2020. I will see strength in 2020. I will see unity in 2020. And those are the words that I was thinking about, you know, as I was creating this piece. Um, you know, in every painting that I make, whether it's this one or any of the pieces that you see in this show or anywhere else that you're seeing them, I like to incorporate like a small little detail, something that maybe you didn't notice the first time you saw the painting, or maybe you have to be really, really close to observe it. And in this piece, I painted three strands of thread weaved into a scarf, and I'm going to see if I can zoom in a little bit. I, I, I don't think, unfortunately, that you're going to be able to, can you guys see my mouse moving? You can. Okay. So right here, and I know it's so hard to see in this photograph, but right there, I weaved into his um, scarf, a red, white, and blue strand of thread. Let me back you out now. Okay. okay. All right, so I did want to discuss, so the model in this piece is actually a very dear friend of mine, and I chose him because I knew he would be able to enter the mind space to carry the emotion of my painting, um, but also because he has the coolest hair, <laughs> and 
I spent weeks with pastel pencils and blades to sharpen these pencils to capture every one of those pearls. And I told him I love his hair, but I never want to paint it again. So this will be the one and only painting of, of this hair. <laughs> okay, so the second piece that I wanted to discuss with you, and I think it's on Is it one. soft pencil or uh, oil? This is not oil pastel, this is soft pastel. And all the work in the show is soft pastel. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. While you're getting to the next piece, one of the questions that we did have was, do you work in other media besides pastels? Um, and why do you prefer pastels maybe to other mediums? So I do like a little bit experiment with other mediums, but my passion lays with pastel. And I mean, I just, I love everything about this medium. And I love that I can use my hands in this medium in a way that I can't with some of the other mediums that I've, I've done. And so pastel is definitely my medium. I do also do like pencils, color pencils, things like that. But um, for the work that I exhibit, I tend to mainly work in pastel. Thank you for the question. All right, so the next piece I wanted to talk about is right here. And let me get us zoomed in. Hold on. Let's go over a bit. Hold on a second. Oops, so very... There we go. Okay. So the second painting I wanted to share with you is part one, the siege. And I'm just going to explain a little bit about this composition. I had these beautiful red glowed, red glowed grapes. They were like as round and humongous as you can imagine. And I knew I wanted to paint them. So I was arranging them in this bowl and I felt like I needed a pop of a different color. So I started adding these green grapes on top of the red grapes in this bowl. And a few of them sort of fell, so sort of fell out. And I kind of stopped and I saw it. I, I saw the story and I could see the deception. It was those four, I'm gonna point to them, it's these, oh, where's my mouse? Here we go. It was these four right here, these four green grapes that were sitting on the side there. Um, you know, it sort of, it was almost like the stem coming down looked like a rope or a ladder. And each of these green grapes were waiting their turn to climb up and attack. So I was in like full war mode when I was painting this. I had some pretty crazy music playing in my studio. And um, after I created this painting, I knew I had to do part two. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly, before I ask if there's questions, I'm gonna quickly take you guys to part two, which is on this side. And in retrospect, I definitely would have put them closer together, but that's okay, hold on, where are we? I need to move. All right, so this was part two, The Spy. And I'm sure some of you can imagine why I titled it that. But, um, okay, so now in this part of the painting, the green grapes have defeated the red grapes with the help of their informant, who is right here. <laughs> and um, I added some, I don't know if you can see this, I added some water drops on him to kind of convey this message of nerves. And I just wanted to mention that, okay, so I finished the siege on December 11th, well before the events that took place at our Capitol on January 6th, people had asked me that, and this, in, this piece is in no way a, reflect, a reflection of what happened. It was completed on December 11th. Um, but I did wanna say, if my paintings do have the power to shape the future, then my next painting will be of green grapes, apples, pears, and bananas all dancing together in perfect happiness. So I don't know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Um, before I go to the next piece, I'm gonna stop one more time to see if anyone has any other questions or anything that they wanted me to discuss in particular. We do have two questions that um, came through on the chat, or at least one that came through on the chat is from Theodora. Do you have your paintings under glass? They don't look like it. Okay, so in this virtual exhibition, no, there's, there's no frame, there's no glass because it's just the images, um, you know, virtually. In actually in real life, yes, 
All of the pastel work is framed under museum um, glass. And I have a spacer in between the actual glass and the painting. So when it rests there, there's a little bit of a gap so that the, the actual paper does not hit the glass. And, um, you know, pastel is an amazing medium. If it is properly framed under glass, it will last, I mean, for a very, very long time uh, without any damage. And if you put the right glass on it with the proper UV coating and everything, um, you know, you're, you're very safe with this medium. Thank you for the question. Um, does anyone else have anything else they, they wanted to add? Uh, in your um, framing, you, you, most of your pictures seem to have black background. Do you use a plain black frame when, with a white map? So I actually don't map my work. I uh, just have it framed directly in the frame. And um, I'm sorry, can you, what was the second part of that question? I was just, you know, your frames, are they basically black frames or? So I usually do like a black frame with like a, not a bright silver, like a dull silver little edge on it. Um, so that's, the, that's usually what the frames look like. I'm sorry you can't enjoy them today with the, the virtual show. I do, I do love the way they look when they're framed, so. Um, do you ever laminate it? Uh, laminate it, meaning like, I'm thinking like a traditional lamination. Laminator, like, yeah. Is that what you meant? Yes. No, no, you don't want it to, you don't want to laminate it. You, you want, if anything, you want there to, you want the painting to be up against a spacer so that again, it's not touching the glass. Nothing's touching it. You don't want anything touching it. You want to sort of leave it alone. We got a couple of people that have asked um, through the chat and then also ahead of time about your surface prep preference or what surface that you use. Oh yes, okay. So I'll go ahead and talk about that real quick. Um, so I can't see myself. So you'll just have to let me know. Can you guys see this? Is that the paper? Yeah, okay, I see thumbs up, thank you. Okay, this is the surface that I work on for 99% of my painting. It is a, it has a lot of tooth to it. Like, okay, ready? I'm gonna scratch it. I, don't, I hope you can hear this. Can you hear that? That's, it's a very gritty, like if you've never felt a bit of floor, it feels like sandpaper. And um, since I blend with my hands and almost all of my paintings, I had to start wearing gloves because it will just take out your fingerprints. It is like a rough sandpaper. And so um, the reason why I use this very toothy pastel paper is because I layer so many layers of pastels. I want to say sometimes up to 10 layers of pastels on the paper and the, the tooth of this paper adheres the pastels and really holds onto it so that I can, I can layer. So this one, if anyone is interested, this particular paper is Art Spectrum Color Fix and it's spelled C-O-L-O-U-R-F-I-X. It's Art Spectrum Color Fix paper. I also really, really love UR uh, pastel paper. And I would really recommend if you are wanting to try pastels after this, which I really hope you do, um, you work on one of these more toothy papers, because if you try to do it on a smooth paper and if you're using really soft pastels, it's gonna start getting really messy and you're not gonna be able to layer and create any definition of the work. So I would really recommend using a, any sort of pastel paper that has a little bit of grit or tooth to it. All right, thank you for that question. All right, so I'm gonna move on now to, um, since we're talking about technique, I'll actually move on. I wanted to talk about technique in the, in one of the pieces on this wall, it's called Persimmon Trio. And I think some of you have, made, have seen this as it was, the, it was used for the ad for the show. All right, so, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure, I think I mentioned this before, but um, pastel is, is my medium. I absolutely love it. I think it's an amazing medium. It's basically just pure pigment with a little bit of binder. And, um, you know, I said this before, but I just, I blend. So I love that I can actually touch and feel the work as I'm moving and painting. That's one of the reasons I really love um, using pastels and I layer so much in my work. And if you ever see a demo or watch me 
I am heavy handed. So my, I'm not like light to the touch. I'm like in there kind of going in there. You can see the pastel dust falling, falling down. So I have to constantly rotate my art so that the, the dust that's falling on the pastel doesn't get into other finished sections that I'm working on. So I do move it around a lot. And I have to say for blending, there is definitely an art to blending pastels. It can get messy very quickly. So you have to know the different elements that create successful blending, such as the pressure, the direction in which you blend. And you know, one day I do think I will have a class on this topic. So, you know, heads up on that. I also, um, I really like to um, add a lot of detail into my work, as I'm sure you can see. And in the stems of this particular piece and the leaves, I used a little bit of a harder pastel and pastel pencils. And people always ask me, how do I sharpen my pencils? And I do not use a traditional sharpener. I use a blade to like scrape at it. And then I use some sandpaper to twist it around and get a nice fine point. And that's how I go in and get some of those details that you're seeing in the leaves and in the stem. Now for the, the body, I guess, of the persimmon, I use the, those really lovely, creamy, luxurious, soft pastels that crumble away. And that's because I'm gonna be blending more with those. And so all of the oranges that you're seeing in this piece were those really, really soft velvety pastels. Um, all right. Does anyone have any other questions about technique or anything relating to materials or anything like that before I move on? Uh, we did get two questions in the chat. One was, do you use any spray fixative? No, 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 I do not. I do not recommend it either. Um, at least for my work, the fixatives, I remember initially trying them and I've tried all of them. I've tried the spray bottle ones. I've tried the um, aerosol ones. I've tried every um, fixative under the sun. They um, change the colors. I don't like the way that they change the colors of my work. And also they're adding another element, um, you know, whatever ingredients are in those fixatives are now going onto my painting. Pastel is pure pigment and I don't wanna mess with that. And it, again, if you frame this properly, it is gonna last. Like you don't need those fixatives. And I have shipped my work all over the world and you all know how rough shipping and handling can go. I have seen footprints on my shipping boxes. That's how rough these boxes are being treated. And the work comes out perfectly fine. So um, I'm happy to not be using fixatives. I'd, I'd rather stick with the pure pigment. And, um, you know, there are some artists who use fixative and I'm not saying anything against that. I think that's great that they use it in their artwork and I'm sure there's no problem for them to use it, but I, I do not, I do not use fixatives. Right, we have a lot of questions coming in. Okay. Um, so maybe we could take a minute and get through those before we just- Sure. Move. So, um, so Dan Fenske asked, how many black pastels would you use on a painting like this? Hi, Dan. Thank you for your question. Um, so on a painting like this, I would say one quarter of a stick of black pastel would be used. Oh, that's all? That's all. Wow. That's all. I know. So it's not start, that you, much. It's not that much. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of, it go, one stick goes a long way. And I, like I told you before, I, I'm heavy handed too. I don't have a light touch. So they're, they're lasting a long time. It's amazing. Thank you. Uh, another one that we have is, do you paint against a photo or against live setup? I do both. So what I do is I have the actual fruit and for me to figure out the composition, there's a lot that goes on with the lighting. I, I, I'm all about the lighting and I love to create these sort of dramatic contrasts between highlights and shadows. And so I, um, I, I create different compositions and test out the lighting and then I photograph a whole bunch of them. And right there, I kind of look at the photographs to see which lighting I like the best. And I, for the composition, like where I actually draw the work, I do work from a photograph or sometimes from my computer because you can just upload images right onto your computer. So I'll work 
right from there. But then when I go back in to get, for example, if we're looking at this painting right now, like all of this leaf work that you see here, I did have to go back to the actual fruit and, um, you know, kind of, you should like really, really close up look at it to kind of capture those details. So it's a bit of a combination of both. And especially with fruit, I do like to have the actual piece in front of me so that I can get the textures and the little dots, whatever else is going on. And I do like to incorporate some of like the blemishes and scratches and things like that. So. Um, yeah, another question we got from Joanne Bodner was, do you use pastel pencils? And if so, what brands? Okay, hi Joanne. I love Faber Castell pastel pencils. Those are my favorite. Mm, I think that they get great coverage and I like the consistency of the and the texture of them. So those are my favorite. Great. Another question we have is do you start at the top and work your way down for some paintings just in case you don't want the dust from the blending to be a problem? Absolutely. So, okay, for all of these pieces, especially the fruits and vegetables, what I'll do is I turn the whole thing upside down to begin and um, get all of the bottom and then turn it around so that none of that black ends up into my composition. I'll turn it to the side, I'll turn it all different directions just so, to avoid that exact problem. But then when I am working on the um, composition. Occasionally, I still do turn it so that it's not getting in something like this piece. After the black goes in, I don't turn it because they were kind of in a line. So nothing had the risk of kind of getting the dust didn't have any risk of falling into something below it. But if I am working on like a portrait or, you know, a different piece that has something underneath, I don't want that pastel falling. So I'll, I'll change the direction. We have, uh, we'll do one more now and then I'll let you keep going. Okay. Um, do you work on only one painting at a time? How long does it take you? Like how many hours would it take you to complete one painting? So I do only work on one piece at a time because I get so invested into the piece. I can't have, my mind just can't get to, the, to another painting until I, I'm in this story. I'm sort of living in it and I have to finish it in order to move on. So I do work one at a time. And I want to say it takes a few weeks to create each piece, but it also really depends on the size and the composition. Um, you know, obviously an eight by 10 pair is going to be a lot shorter than a portrait. So it, it does depend on that, but on average, I'd say a few weeks. All right. Thank you for all these questions, by the way. And okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on to another portrait that I wanted to talk about. And let me... Sorry if I'm making anyone dizzy here. Okay, here we go. There we go. Okay. All right, so the title of this painting is Everything. And it's a story about human emotions and specifically attempting to attain like what our idea of perfection is. And in this piece, she is a dancer, but the emotions she is feeling, you know, can be felt by anyone from anywhere. And the main question she is facing is, have I lost what grounds me to earth and reality? And have I started to fall into insanity and obsession? And the model I used for this piece is a dancer and she was perfect. I gave her, a brief synopsis of what this piece would be about. And she was able to portray that in her motions. And there was one moment when she was, cause she posed for hours, just, you know, we were experimenting with things. There was one particular moment um, when I knew I had the piece because of her hand. I'm gonna see if I can kind of zoom in a little bit um, on this hand. Um, right there, I think that's a little bit better. Um, it had so much power in it and it was, it was the stance, it was so strong and fierce. And it kind of made, it, it, was, it was that question I was asking, is it passion or has it gone beyond? And that's what I wanted this piece to, to really be about. And I felt like that hand there and the way that her expression was really kind of um, helped tell that story. And um, for those of you who do follow me on my Instagram page, I have posted um, 
you know, I posted a few videos on the process of creating and painting this piece. And there's one video where I actually, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can zoom out again, sorry. Okay, and here's my mouse. So right down here in this section right here, I actually wrote the word dance in pink pastel, the same color that I used for the pink tool. And then I blended that word into the shadows and some of the highlights of that tool. And I do often do that. I often, you know, write a word or phrase or something right into the painting and use that in the piece itself to help tell the story. And I, I have to tell you with the tool on this piece and the sheer, the aspects of the sheer that were happening, it was definitely challenging, but it was amazing. It was so fun to do. It was so fun to create these folds and these abstract shapes that sort of just all form together to create this jumble of beautiful pink tool. And so I had so much fun creating this one. And I, I um, you know, wanted to talk about that piece. And there is one last portrait that I, I wanted to make sure I have time, and I do, to talk about. So I'm going to talk about it before we lose time, lose track of time. And then I'll, I'll, I'll take some more questions. Oh, hold on. Let me back up out of here. Um, where did it go? Oh, he was right next to us. OK. All right, so, all right, this is my dad. And this is definitely the trickiest piece in the show for me to explain. And, you know, I thought about it a lot and I came to the conclusion that there must not be a word or words to describe how I feel about my dad. And I think that's why I was so compelled to create this painting. I wanted to, you know, pour my feelings about him into this artwork. And all I can say is that my sister and I kind of hit the jackpot when it comes to our parents. And my dad, if you've ever met him, he has this way of making anyone around him feel like I can just let go and he will just take care of everything with a smile on his face and happiness in his heart. And you can just feel it. It's not, he never does anything out of obligation. It's because he wants to, and you can feel that. You can feel when somebody genuinely wants to do something for you. And he, and I know I'm his daughter and he feels that way about me, but he feels that way about so many other people too. And, um, you know, I didn't tell him in advance that I would be painting him. I just showed up at his house and I asked him if he had his hat that he always wears in winter and if he would pose for me. And he said, what? Okay, okay. And so he, he posed and I remember my husband saying, hey, his collar isn't straight. Don't you want to fix that? And I said, no, because that's my dad. He could care less about things like that. He, his, so, you know, crooked collar and all, this is one of my favorite paintings. And I, I told my dad, um, you know, and my mom that a part of every painting is, is for them, but this one is for me. This one is for me and it is hanging in my house. And I just, it makes me so happy to see it. And, um, you know, I'm really lucky to have the parents that I have there. I could probably spend the next two hours just telling you stories about them, but I will not. <laughs> and, um, you know, this was definitely, I think the hardest piece for me to talk about in this show without getting emotional. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna stop here for just a second and see if there are any other questions that anyone has, please go ahead and unmute yourself and, you know, go ahead and ask anything that you wanna ask. Um, what brand of pastels do you use? Any, anyone in particular? Yes, okay. So remember when I was talking about like how some pastels are really creamy and luxurious and velvety. So for those really, really soft pastels, I love to use Terry Ludwig. I love to use Sennelier. And I absolutely love, those are, those are some of my, my favorites. 
um, Rembrandt. I really like Rembrandt, though it's not as creamy as the um, the Terry Ludwig's and the Sennelier. They're a little bit on the harder side, but they're still very, they're very, very good pastels. Um, for the harder pastels, Faber Castell. I absolutely love them. I love the Faber Castell. They make um, like a pastel stick and also pastel pencils. So those are definitely my favorite. Thank you for the question. Any, any other questions about any of the paintings or the process or anything else? Yeah, how do you make that water droplets? I like that in your fruits. On it, they are on the fruits, right? It's so yes. Nice. Let me let's go to one. Let's go to one. Again, sorry for for the dizzy turning. Let me see which one has like a nice juicy drop on it. All right, let me see if this one does. Uh, kind of. And I think there's a better one that has. Actually, there is a piece that I could. We're talking about water drops. Let me get to, and I'm sorry again for all this turning. Here it is. There we go. Okay, so um, this painting is actually called The Brave Club. And the reason I titled it that, I'm turning this a little bit. The reason I titled it that, I sort of imagined these, this group of fruit on a stage and it was time for this one's, this one's solo. And it's again with the nerves and feeling a little bit nervous about doing something. And so I put these water drops on it to kind of, you know, convey that message. And the thing about water drops, they go on at the very end, as does all of the detail on my work. So if there's a scratch or little dots of, um, you know, any details on the fruit, I put that all on at the end. So this plum that you're seeing right now is fully completed. And at the very end, it's a lot of pastel pencil. So I'll take kind of one darker value and one lighter, and I'll go around and get that shadow that you're seeing around the drop. Then I'll use a lighter pastel pencil to get the bottom. If you notice how mm -hmm. the bottom has a little bit of light hitting the bottom and then also that big bright, big bright spot that you see when you're um, seeing the, it's really just all a matter of reflection and being able to lighten and darken something that's already underneath because you don't want it to look like a separate entity. You want it to look like it's sitting on the surface of the actual plum. And if you use the wrong colors, it looks like a water drop that's out of place. It doesn't look like it belongs. And so, um, you know, it's kind of experimenting with the colors and the shadows. Thank you for the question. Thank you. We have another one that was kind of um, also on just your technique. Uh, do you start with the darkest values or does it depend? Um, does it vary depending on the subject that you have? In general, yes. In general, I do work dark to light. Um, occasionally there's exceptions to that. But the reason why I like to go dark to light is because um, when, when you go the other way, you get to, it, how do I explain this or anything? You can see the light underneath and it doesn't blend nicely at all. I like to build up the colors and by building up, I go darker to lighter to lighter to lighter and you sort of feel that depth as you're moving out of it. And so that's why I, I do like to generally work dark to light. Thank you for the question. Are there any other questions? I have a lot, but I'm going to give everybody a chance uh, that people that wrote in ahead of time. I have some more questions. Okay, but go ahead. If anybody here wants to go too, just chime in. I don't want to. Oh, we're good. Oh, well, the one in the chat from Barbara Mason is, do you find it more challenging to paint fabric and folds and portrait artwork? versus contrast and light in your still life works? So in general, no. Okay. But so when we were talking about uh, the painting that everything is painted So, okay, something like this, this one is painting right here. The folds in the fabric actually, there's no sheerness in the fabric. And so it was, it was very similar, I would say, to any of the other pieces with shadows and light that I'm working on. But when I'm working on something like sheer fabric or embroidered fabric, 
fabric with jewels. Yeah, it's definitely a different meaning. So, yes, thank you for the question. Erica, you said there was a few others, right? Yep. Um, and so we have um, many of your pastels or formal portraits of flawless fruit and vegetables, which we all obviously can see flawless. Oh, thank you. Um, but why do you choose the fruit over maybe not as many people or flowers or animals? So you're right. Generally, I do do still life. And I have exhibited my still life the most out of any other genre of work. I think what happened was when I started my art career, I started entering competitions. And the first piece I ever ever entered was of tomatoes. And I was at that time was really lucky enough to win an award for it. And it got a lot of attention. And so I started creating, I, had, I got this idea of what I wanted to do with these fruits. I had this story in my mind. And like somebody had asked earlier, do you work on um, one piece at a time or do you go back and forth? And I think I got into this headspace and this vision of these fruits and this still life. And I got all these ideas and they were just flowing and I had to create them. So I started creating all these still lifes and eventually I entered all those into competitions and started getting known as a fruit and vegetable artist. <laughs> and so I, you know, I continued with that. And when I was working with my galleries, people were just loving the still life. So I just kept creating that. But I have to tell you, even with the still life genre, I feel, I still feel like they're anything but still and that they have life and I have stories and they have personalities and they have, I've done family portraits of fruits and vegetables. And so they still do all have, you know, some energy to them. Um, and I think the reason I created these stories is because um, I started in portraiture. When I was 16 years old, I was selling portraits and I love portraits and this year in 2020 I really created more portraits than any other year so though I do do still like a lot and I love it and I will continue to do it I've definitely started to increase my number of portraits as well thank you for the question it's about 7 20 I have one more question on here and then that way if you had anything else you wanted to cover I just don't want you to get cut off but um, we had a question about that some paintings have prices and others don't. So are some for sale, some not, some sold already? Yes, yeah, some of them have sold. I tried to mostly put pieces that have not sold in the show, but some of them have sold. So the ones that are available are the ones that you'll see prices on. If there is a piece that, um, for example, like my dad, I will not sell that piece. So that one has not sold, I guess to me, it's sold to me. But um, other than that, the most of the pieces have sold. And there are a few pieces in the portrait category that I wanted to, they're brand new, and I wanted to exhibit them in um, other exhibitions before they go out to sale. So for example, um, this one right here and this one right here are still available, but I, they are not for sale at the moment. So thank you for the question. All right, so I think I have time to maybe talk about one more painting because I do want to I do want to address those questions that um, Erica has. And again, if you do have anything, any comment or question or anything that we don't get to address tonight, um, please reach out to me. You can email me or contact me on Instagram. I, I would love to um, answer any of the questions that you might have. All right, so I think we're going to have time for one more piece to talk about. And I've got to go to my Santa Fe chilies. So let me find them. And I, of course, I'm turning all around the room. So if it's bothering you, just close your eyes for a minute. Hold on, here we go. And they were probably right behind me. Yeah, <laughs> they went in a full circle, they were right there. Okay. All right, so this is the last piece I'll talk about today, at least. I mean, oops, wrong way. There we go. All right, the title of this painting is Red or Green. And okay, so some of you may have been to Santa Fe, but those of you have, who have not been to Santa Fe, they are so well known for the beautiful, amazing, delicious New Mexican chilies that they grow there. And I have visited Santa Fe numerous times because I, one of the first galleries that I joined 
was a gallery out in Santa Fe on Canyon Road. And they have unfortunately just now closed. But prior to that, um, I would have exhibitions out there and travel out there for the exhibition so that we could do meet the artists and things like that. And oh my gosh, this place is amazing, not only for its nature, but for its food. The food in Santa Fe is something else. And if you go to a restaurant out there and you're getting the Mexican food, you're going to get asked a question about whether you want the green chili sauce, the red chili sauce, or Christmas, which is both. And so I kind of wanted to create a piece that sort of uh, tied that element of Santa Fe into these chilies and put both into them, the red and the green. And that's what this piece is about. And um, I hope to be going back there again soon because it is, for me as an artist, one of the most inspirational places to visit. And um, that was really the last piece that I wanted to talk about today. If there was a certain piece that I didn't talk about that you did want me to talk about, just um, let me know. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and answer the rest of the questions. I think everyone's okay. So. Yeah, we had one question um, that Susu had asked that I don't think I asked before when we started. I got a little bit out of order, but I think we talked about it earlier today. If there was um, a particular artist that uh, really influenced your work, did we do that already? Think so. I don't think so. I think we talked about that before the Zoom. So, <laughs> okay, okay. So, obviously, um, some of the masters that you know focused in still life and focused a lot in realism influenced me. I think if I had to choose one, that was the one that I felt most connected with and most inspired by and most in awe of it would definitely be Jacques-Louis David. And I'm sure many of you who have been to France and have seen the coronation of Napoleon know the feeling of standing in front of this enormous painting full of detail and just extraordinary talent. It's, it's pretty much mind blowing and is definitely one of my uh, favorite artists. Thank you for the question. Erica, uh, are there any others? We have one more question. Um, can you please tell us about the painting called Balance? Yes. Um, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm taking you in a circle again. There it is. All right. All right. So this piece. All right. Too too far. All right. This one is the balancing act three, and that's because there was a balancing act two and a balancing act before it. And um, this particular piece was initially inspired. So the first original balancing act that I ever did was right after this major storm we had in New Jersey. Um, it was Superstorm Sandy that really devastated the coast of New Jersey. And I was living on the coast of New Jersey at the time. And I was living in Long Branch, right on the beach. And this storm, it was something else. And when we went back, because we had to evacuate, and when we went back to the beach the next time, I mean, it was kind of nuts, but there were stones everywhere. There were stones in the sand everywhere. And, um, how, and, and I'm, I, I go out to the beach after the storm had passed and I'm looking at all these stones and there's a lot of people out there and there's this beautiful rainbow in the sky. This just kind of like surreal moment that you're standing there after this devastation that just has occurred. There are homes toppled and buildings toppled and businesses ruined. And there's this beautiful rainbow up in the sky and all these stones everywhere. And I just thought, wow, that's quite a balance. And I started collecting all these stones and I got home and was thinking about balance and all of this. And I started thinking, well, here's an interesting way to sort of get these pieces just at the edge of where it can't be realistic anymore where they would actually topple and create a form that made you feel something about 
you know, stability and balance. And every piece after that, all of the stones are from the beaches at the Jersey Shore. And they are all, um, you know, pieces that I do to kind of, you know, reflect form and shape in different sizes and what it all means. Uh, so thank you so much for asking that question. And we probably just have time for maybe one more, um, if anyone had anything else to add. Or add. Yeah, there was actually one more question. And then I think that that'll be it for the questions unless we decide to continue on. But um, uh, Susu wanted to know what painting you liked or looked at last month. So, um, so what's maybe one of the more recent paintings that you uh, got a chance to take a look at that you, that you liked? Right, um, am I asking that right, Susu? You can unmute yourself if you want, if I didn't get that right. I guess I got it right. Um, if you mean like what other artists inspired me, is that kind of what you were going for? Oh, I can I can see your mouth moving, but I, I can't hear <laughs> what it is. So, okay, I'll just, I'll kind of answer that how oh. I'm interpreting it. Do, do um, you hear me? Oh, oh, yeah, I can hear you. oh, oh, sorry. Uh, what I meant is, mm, you know, lately, recently, I just want to know, like, what did you look at? It can be anything, like, what kind of painting, or if if you didn't look any painting, maybe you, what music you, like, recently, like, what what kind of mood? Because it's, it's just, you, you just show, right? I just, just curious. <laughs> oh, sure. So, as far as what type of art that I look at. Um, I don't know, okay, so probably not, not, not too many people know this, but I love to collect old books. And I go to estate sales and try to scope out and search for, you know, old books. And I get really excited about it when I find one. And a few years back, I found at an estate sale, a collection of 14 just incredible. I, I can't really explain to you how incredible these art pieces are. It's a book of all the old masters. And now that we are sort of not spending as much time these days out and about in the world, I actually have time to look through these books and read them and learn about these artists. And it is unbelievable. Some of the some of the works that have come across Cezanne and um, you know, all the old masters. It's been amazing. And as far as music goes, when I'm in my studio, I actually kind of tie the music to the mood of the painting that I'm working on. So for the, for the painting, everything with the ballerina, I was looking to a lot of Billie Eilish because it's kind of a more angsty, somber sort of, sort of mood. And then for the spy and the siege, you can only imagine what I was listening to for those sort of pieces. Um, and you know, I, I, I like to do that. I like to, I, it really helps me get in the zone. So I like to pair whatever I'm listening to with whatever I feel the piece is supposed to be about. And okay, I think it's past 730 and you guys, I just want to thank you again so much for joining me today and learning more about me as an artist. And I hope that it helped you maybe understand my art a little bit more and, um, you know, thank you so much again for joining me today. Yeah, I think this is, we're off to such a great start um, with our virtual artist talks. And thank you to everybody that participated. A very special thanks to Dan Fenske and Marianne Ficarra who lead our exhibition committee. Um, we're trying to get creative in these really challenging times, but keeping the arts community together is really important. So thank you to you guys too, so. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Sangeeta. Oh, thank you, Erica. Yes, we'll talk soon. Yes, we will. I see everybody waving goodbye. All right, bye, <laughs> everyone. Thank you so much.